All right, welcome back, everyone. Hope you had a nice long lunch. So we're going to continue talking about front end, and we're going to get our app hooked up with our back end today. And so there's a very short lecture, and then it'll be a lot of more hack time. But I thought I should mention a couple of miscellaneous topics. One being cores. What the heck is cores? <clears throat> Was cross-origin resource sharing. And so historically, browsers would actually block all cross-origin requests from, that originate from scripts. What's a cross-origin request? Well, anytime you're visiting a web page, you're at a certain origin, so a certain domain name. And you can request pages from other domain names. And so yesterday, we actually ran into a bug caused by this when we tried to fetch from our back end directly from our front end. Because that's a cross-origin resource, meaning right now we're working with localhost 3000, and we wanted to refetch, grab something from 3001. So it's different origins. And so the browser actually said, hey, I'm going to block that out of security. But a lot of developers were a little bit annoyed about that because it's not rare that you will have to try to request something from another origin. So what happened? Well, cores allow some of these requests to be made. And so the server that the responds actually has to set a particular header that allows cores. And so that header is called access control allow origin. And, if, and so what happens at the very low level is that first, um, when you call fetch or an XHR request or AJAX, it actually makes a pre-flight request, which means it sends something like, hey, I'm about to make a request to you. Can I? And if they respond with a header that says, yes, you can, then it goes ahead and makes that request. And so yesterday, we ran into this because our back end did not explicitly set this header. Therefore, the Chrome browser said, hey, I'm not going to let you request any information across sites. And so my, why may browsers actually block this? <clears throat> so think back to yesterday when we wrote that code that was, while true, alert a pop-up. That was an example of some sort of just bad script, right? Something that annoyed the user, something that could actually cause some problems. Actually, it did cause problems with me at home because I left that running the entire day and I just could not close the window just because like the thread had buffered up so much. So this is another example of something that a bad programmer could create. So it may be you visit their web page and you don't know it, but behind the screens, the script is actually trying to go grab some malware or something like that. And so that's why the browsers prevented um, cross-origin requests from being made. But since the developers were annoyed by that, that's why cores came about. And so how do we get around this? Or what happens if you don't have access to the server? What happens if you can't say, hey, explicitly set this header? You have to then make requests outside of your front-end scripts. And so that's what we're going to do using a reverse proxy. Has anybody heard this term before? So what it does is it's a server, a program, that retrieves data from another server on behalf of a certain client. And so data is then returned to the client as if the server was the one who gave that response. <clears throat> and it's generally done using this program called Nginx. Here's a link if you want to go read that. But what Nginx is, is it's a specialized server that can do load balancing, it can do clustering, it can route stuff all over, and it's an uh, alternative to Apache. So you might have used Apache in the previous CS50 year. Um, but Nginx is actually the N in mean stack. So we learned MongoDB, we learned Express. We chose not to learn Angular, and we're choosing not to use Nginx because you can actually do it within Express. And so we will use request, which is a GitHub, it's an NPM module, and we'll use that to create our reverse proxy. And so again, what our reverse proxy does is it says, hey, send requests to me, and I will go get the information for you and return it back as if I was the originator. Does that make sense? Cool. Um, so the difference between a reverse proxy and a normal proxy, does anybody know what that is? So a normal proxy hides the requester from the responder, but a reverse proxy hides the responder from the requ requester. And so any sort of load balancing or any sort of um, like clustering is done using a reverse proxy. Because you don't know what server you're asking. You're just asking 
the reverse proxy, which then it goes fetches it from some arbitrary server that you don't know where it is. Yeah. Um, so say you <clears throat> say you're in high school and your AP scores are released, but they're only released in New York and they're not yet released in California. You can say, hi, hey, I'm in California, but I want to make it look like I'm in New York. So I'll use a proxy server, which is located in New York. And for all the AP test score give routers, no, I'm located in New York. And so you'll be using a proxy to make it seem as if you were requesting. And so, yeah, people use that for Netflix <laughs> if they're outside of the country and for any other sketchy behavior, maybe. Yeah. What's the difference between a proxy and a VPN? Um, a VPN is a private network. where you can like tunnel into that network and make it seem as if you're in that network as a computer within that network, rather than hiding you as a person behind a proxy. So it's a little subtle thing there. And does everybody understand the difference between a, the proxy that I just described, like acting like you're somewhere else, versus using a reverse proxy, whereas you're hiding the, your back end? So let's go ahead and implement this reverse proxy. So we're going to be using this request, <clears throat> which is a simplified HTTP request client. And what it does is it's just, essentially, it's fetch for the back end. So you can make requests using Node.js. And so we can browse through this if we want, or I'll just start using it. And then you can see some syntax. So has everybody been able to clone this repo, the dorm supplies front end? Yeah, so if not, go ahead and do that now. You're cloning a new repo, so it should be relatively quick. And right now we have just an empty skeleton project. And we're going to go ahead and start connecting that up to our back end. And so we'll do that in our routes. Uh, this is the wrong project. And so you may have worked this, with this a little bit earlier today. And what we were doing is we, were, we had some hard-coded test data. But now we're going to actually hook this up to our back end to receive the real test data. And so first we can define, um, we want to const request gets request. So go ahead and include request into your file. <coughs> so this is in the route file. So if you're in your dorm supplies um, directory, then if you cd into routes, then you have this index.js, which defines your routes. And so within that, I already did for you this const request gets request. And so now we're going to start using that request. Uh, yep. So. The flow of this is we define our routes in a separate file, and then within within here we we require our routes and then dispatch all of our um, requests into that. So this is the same code that I think I went over yesterday. So within routes, we're going to start using requests. So right now we uh, for our slash endpoint, a get slash, we just render index and we pass it some hard-coded data. But first, let's actually grab the real data. And so where is the real data stored? What endpoint? It's on our API server. Under which endpoint? Get... Um, this is in dorm supply, so it's get items, right? Right, can everybody see? And so if we made a request to our backend server for get items, we would get all of our items. And so how do we actually make that request? 
well, we can now start using that request package. So if you read the documentation, you would know that request.get is a function, and you can pass it some config. You can pass it a URL, and our URL is going to be localhost colon 3000 slash users. We can pass it some headers, though we don't want to really set any headers. We can pass it a form, though we don't really want to set a form. So that's it. And so that will get us the JSON. Uh, items, good call. Um, and I believe this returns a promise. Or I actually have it coded different on mine. All right, let's do this for now. Um, so it grabs all of those, and then it can take an optional callback, I believe. Um, dum -dum -dum. takes a callback, I believe, somewhere. Which takes an error, the response, and um, the user. And then let's see what it returns. So function, error, response an error the incoming message object and the response body and so It'll be JSON since we know we're passing back JSON. Right? Makes sense? And so we can go ahead and do that. So error, the response, which we're probably going to ignore, and then our items. And then let's just do a console.log the items just to see what it returns. And then go ahead and just return res.render index anyway. That way we just send a response. And now we can run this. Everybody got that? Everybody good? So if we just npm run, or let's just do it manually, node dorm supplies. So that's running. And if we submit the request, what do we expect to happen? Uh, 3001. It worked, but it console logged undefined. Not why might that have happened? Close. You're onto something. We did forget to start a server, right? Our API server is not actually running, so we need to make sure that's running as well, so that we can request things from that. And 
And so now we should make sure that they're actually items within our database, which there are. We can go ahead and remake that request. So refresh, we get the same index page back. Uh, still undefined. Is my syntax wrong? I'm wondering why it's not actually sending something. Unexpected bug on the front end. <clears throat> Let me check something real quick. Use it the same exact way earlier, but interesting. Um, let's see. Right, let me just try one thing real quick. Hmm. For some reason, it's not fetching things. Uh, sorry guys. Uh, 
Okay, bug is this. Um, so you have to give it a URL that begins with HTTP, otherwise it will try to request it on your own domain. That was our, our unfortunate bug that took me a while to fix. Whew, sweating. <laughs> um, so that, yeah, that's the debugging process. So you have to give it a real URL as somewhere on the internet. So including HTTP colon slash slash. And so that gives us back JSON and what we're doing is we're using json.parse, which turns JSON into an actual JavaScript object, and taking that object and passing it directly into this index file. Did I lose anybody in my panic? <laughs> or is everybody with me? So essentially what we're doing is we're doing a request.get for this URL, which goes and grabs from our back end whatever start at slash items. And then we're saying, hey, console.log those items so we know that we're actually getting it. And so it was console.logged, this big array. And then we're saying, all right, feed into our index page as a local variable called items, the items object. And we're using json.parse so that it turns that JSON into a real JavaScript object. Because what's the difference between JSON and a JavaScript object? Or, yeah, anyone? One is just a certain way. One's a formatting rule, and one's an actual variable. And so JSON is just a notation. It's a way that you should specify. It's a stringified version of a object. And so it is just a string. And so when we receive that string, we need to make sure, hey, actually parse that string and turn it into a real JavaScript object, which is what this json.parse function does. Yeah? No, so this is, um, so the last part about of the to-do that I guess very few people got to was finish writing this index page. And so within our flow of the application, so right now we're defining our routers, right? And so we're saying for a certain listener at slash, slash get, if you get a route here, do some stuff, and then return res.render this. And so this is something that we worked with yesterday. Does everybody remember what res.render did? So it looks for an index file within whatever we say our views directory is, which is specified in our file our app file. So here we set our view engine and we set our view directory. And so it looks in our view directory for something called index, index.pug. And then index.pug, we pass that a local variable called items. And what do we set items equal to? We set it equal to whatever we received from our request.get. Does that make sense? Yeah. Where is that, where is that view engine, uh, um, so when they visit this page, so if we go see that view, um, so this is this is the front end server that we're now coding. So the, I don't know if I understand your question. So <clears throat> I'm, gonna I'm gonna answer what I think is your question. Okay. So right now we're writing a reverse proxy. And so what we're doing is saying, you're requesting this information from me, and I'm gonna go ahead and request that information from the back end, get it, and then turn it into something that's viewable to you. And so the end user does not know that an API exists, does not know that we wrote an API, which is a separate server, 
all they know is they're asking for an index page, which should show all of our items. And so we're saying, hey, I don't know what our actual items are. We're only the front end page. We create our views. So I'm going to go ahead and ask the back end page, hey, give me all the items so I can show it to the user. And so that's what we're doing with our request.get. That is an NPM package called request that allows us to make get requests from the back end. And what we're doing is we're writing a get request to our back end, which is HTTP slash slash localhost colon 3000 slash items, which is the endpoint that we wrote last week on our API server. And if we remember back then, what we did is we did a res.json all of our items. And so this returns all of our items in JSON format. And so what we're doing here is we're saying, all right, now we have fetched all of that, those items. And so what we're going to do is say, hey, use those items, create an index page, and send it back to the user. And so the user does not know that we have two separate backends because we created a reverse proxy. All they know is they're visiting our server and asking for our index page. And then we're doing all this stuff behind the scenes to fetch the information, parse through that information, display that information, render it into a template, a view, and we're going to send that back. Did that answer your question? So we're accessing this page. So if we were to run um, that node dorm supplies, node dorm supplies front end.js, that creates our server, our program server, which is listening at HTTP localhost 3001. And so we visit that URL, localhost 3001, slash, slash, because this is the root. And so if we visit localhost colon 3001, this is what we get. Correct. Does that make sense to everyone? Is anybody, does anybody have questions? Anybody lost? Yeah. It's not a specific question, but so if you go to the config file to support 3001, mm -hmm. Yep. Exactly. And so what happens if we now change our backend location? We would have to go change this hard-coded URL for every single route that we ever create. And so it becomes a good idea to now abstract that out into our what file? The config file. And so let's go ahead and do that. So within app slash models, there's a file called config.js. And let's go ahead and stick the API URL in there, which I already did for you. And so now within our routes file, we already imported config. We have const config gets require the config file. And so what can we change the URL to? Yeah, so config.api URL plus whatever endpoint we want to get. Make sense to everybody? Uh, nothing. So no difference between a route and an endpoint. I'll just use those interchangeably. Any questions? And so now our databases, our database can now talk to our backend server. So they talk back and forth. And now our backend server and our front end server can now talk back and forth. And so now we have a whole web platform altogether. Yeah? Is the point of the backend always returning JSON files if you just integrate them into JavaScript objects? Um, so, yeah, so question is what's the point of sending JSON if we're just going to convert it into JavaScript objects? Is because within the internet, everything gets sent as a string of characters. And so when you visit an HTML page, if you look at the view page source, this is exactly what the browser sees. It's just a string of characters. And only because it knows it's HTML does it know to display it as HTML. And so when we send information from, um, from our API to our front end, we need some sort of notation that says, hey, this is a JavaScript object, because it's just a big line of text, a big string. And so that's why JSON was created. JSON was created to standardize what the 
what a JavaScript object would actually look like when you send it as text data. And so there's no actual way to just say, hey, I'm going to send this JavaScript variable. We're only sending it rendered as a string, as in like its JSON format, which means you can just cast it to a JavaScript object immediately. And so there's no way to say, hey, I want to send a JavaScript object. You have to send text over the internet. Does that make sense? Does that answer your question? Yeah. Any questions? None? All right, so what we're going to do for the rest of the time today is that we're going to break into your partners again and then start building out the front end now. And so now that we have it hooked up to our back end, we can now make back end calls like that. And I want you to first um, implement the page, the index page. And so we already have it hooked up so that it grabs stuff from our back end. What happens if you want to add more data to that index page, more test data? You can go ahead and just insert into the database using calls straight to your API. And so get that all implemented. Right now it just looks like this. So there should be an item here. It just means, hey, implement me. And then I want you to implement all of the forms. So I want you to implement your CRUD for the front end. So forms to create new items on the front end. So you have a form that way you don't have to use Postman. And updating items, deleting items maybe. And what's the last one? Yeah, reading. So we have we done that or what? We've already done that, right? So the index page is already the reading the retrieving. So go ahead and implement CRUD, save, delete for last um, for everything if you have time. Cool. And I'll be floating around answering questions. Sam, another TF in the back, is also free to answer questions. Everybody feel OK? Anybody lost? OK, go ahead and break off. You may also notice that in the config file, there's something called a default image. <clears throat> and so we did not specify in our um, schema that image had to be included. And so I put a default image there just in case, hey, if this file does not have an image attached to it, if like the, Im the item doesn't have an image, go ahead and use this default image instead. So I'll let you figure out how to do that. Is anybody lost? Any clarifications? No? All right, go ahead and break off into your pairs, and good luck. Yo. Oh, um, is anybody missing a partner from earlier? Okay, so you go ahead and be with the party. Yeah. Was that a question, Daniel, or just stretching? Oh. I keep getting that. 